All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here with Marcus Sheridan today, and a brief background about Marcus. In uh, 2001, Marcus stumbled across his first business with two friends and began installing swimming pools out of the back of a beat-up pickup truck. Nine years later, and with the help of incredible innovations through inbound and content marketing, Marcus's company overcame the collapse of the housing market and became one of the largest pool installers in the U.S. And then in 2019, he started his own sales, marketing, and personal personal development blog called The Sales Lion and has since been synonymous with inbound and content marketing ex expertise while being featured in multiple industry publications, including the New York Times, where he was referred to as the web marketing guru. And today we are going to talk about content marketing, where do I start? Marcus, how are you doing today? Man, I'm doing great. Glad to be here, buddy, and to talk about a subject that uh, has as you mentioned, it's had a big impact in my life, so uh, ready to rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, to, to say it's had a big impact on your life has been an understatement. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, I was at your, one, of your, one of your biggest first presentations where you talked about how your company, the, the, the river pools and spas, was, was going under, and content marketing brought it out of its depths. And uh, I guess you were doing content marketing before it was called content marketing, if I'm not mistaken. And so I know it's well, meant a lot I mean, to you. you know, and... Yeah, I mean, you know, in 2008, that's when the market crashed. Nobody could uh, afford to get pools. A lot of people can get loans anymore. A lot of people are sitting around the house. I was going to go out of business. I mean, I really was. I had three consultants say, you should file bankruptcy. And, and so that's when I started to read about the Internet. And the thing is, Dave, there's a lot of fancy phrases online, and, you know, there's you got content marketing, social media marketing, inbound marketing, blogging, and all these other things, all these other things. And every, mm -hmm. every time I read something, in my mind, what I was seeing was, look, Marcus, if you take the time to answer the questions of your prospects and customers, you do it on your website, you do it through text and video, you could be really successful. And uh, so that became our, our motto, our philosophy, right? And uh, four simple words they ask you answer. And those four words really have changed my life, and they've since changed the lives of, of many businesses. And I think when you say getting started with content marketing, to me it starts with simplistically understanding what it is and how to get going. And I think they ask you answer is a great place to be because now you're taking away the science and you just say, okay, how many questions have you gotten over the years about that thing that you do, that you sell, and currently how many are answered on your website? Chances are it's very, very few, and that's where the work starts. Yeah, no, I know. I hear you. I hear you. And, um, you know, from being, you know, in this in industry a bit as well, I I've noticed that there's sometimes some confusion when you say, and, and it's kind of funny sometimes when we go into companies and we ask them, hey, I, and it's actually – uh, not not to kind of steal your thunder. I mean, I, I got this advice directly from you when we hired you as a consultant way back when, and you said the very first place to start is go in and get everybody in your company to to write down the top five or ten most common questions. And uh, the funny part I was saying is sometimes you get is what time are you open and stuff like that, and you're going to get that. But can you dig into that a little bit more because that's the that is probably I I have used that advice and I've paid that forward and I said listen start there yeah man can you dig well, into that because that is like it seems like a very simplistic thing but it also is if you unlock that if you really unlock that no this is what I'm talking about these are the kinds of questions you're going to get and answer the can you dig into that a little bit because I've gotten some people who've been a little bit confused with that and then all of a sudden once they get it they're like oh now I understand. So if you could dig into that yeah, a little the bit. The philosophy of the Ask You Answer is you approach it like this. If somebody was considering your stuff, if they had a problem, what are the questions that they're asking themselves? And therefore, that indicates the things they're searching online, right? Mm -hmm. And so, for example, let's just use a fiberglass pool. So if somebody wants if, – if somebody all of a sudden says to themselves, you know what? Our buddy got a fiberglass pool. I think I might want to get a fiberglass pool. So in that moment when they say, I might want to get a fiberglass pool or even I might want to get an in-ground pool, what are the questions that they have? 
Well, it's pretty obvious. One of the first questions they're going to have is, well, how much does this thing cost? That's one of the first questions they're going to have. Mm -hmm. So they're going to go online, and they're going to say something like, how much does a fiberglass full cost or fiberglass full cost or fiberglass full pricing? That's the type of stuff they're going to search. And when we embrace the philosophy of the ask you answer, we said, all right, it doesn't matter if the question is good, bad, or ugly. If we, it, it doesn't, whether we've ever addressed it or not online, it doesn't matter because the only thing that matters is, is the consumer asking this? And if mm -hmm. they're asking it, are we willing to be a part of the conversation? And so because we wrote that article, literally that one article did, made us millions in sales. And I'm not kidding when I say that. I mean, because we have mm -hmm. the advanced analytics, you know that you see me explain it. It made us over $3 million in sales to this date. One single article because we were willing to address a subject that nobody else addressed. And keep in mind, we didn't put a price list up there, but we were willing to explain, okay, this is what drives the cost of a fiberglass pull-up. This is what drives it down. This is what you're going to see in the industry. This is what you'll see from some swimming pool builders. This is what you see from others. And, you know, that's just one example. So any question that they were asking, you know, people would say, so what's the difference between the concrete and the fiberglass pool? Which is better, concrete or fiberglass pools? What are the problems with fiberglass pools? What's the best type of patio to get around a swimming pool? What's the best type of pool for a small backyard? I mean, you just keep going down the list, David. Mm -hmm. The questions are astronomical. We hadn't answered any of them. And so now we said we're going to address them really, really well through text and video. That same process can be replicated with your team over and over again. Like you said, it's a brainstorm process. You say, what are they asking? But it's not about you. Don't make the question about you, your company. Nobody ever says, what are your rates? I've never gone to Google and said, what are your rates in Google? I've, I've never done that before. Mm -hmm. I've asked how much things cost, but I don't ask, what are your rates? And so that's why we have to be specific as they would search it online, then we have to address it that way within the context of the post or the video or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've seen you, um, you know, talk about that, and I've seen, you know, just through, blo um, you know, conversations on blogs, you know, with the comments and, and stuff, I've seen people get really confused and have some resistance to talking about cost, talking about price, you know. But that's not what you're saying, because, like, if you are – say, a marketing agency, you can't really put cost up there. I mean, you know, custom proposals and all that. But you can talk about, like, what's going to, going to go into and affect, the, affect your costs. And I think when people really understand that, nobody in the world should say, I don't want to write about that. I don't I mean, of course, you know, and, and I think that's, that's something that you've really helped a lot of people understand and explain, you know, and, and well, move forward with, with their own strategy. The only thing I really do well is I help people look in the mirror and see how they themselves uh, expect to be treated and how they themselves behave. And the fact is, if you or I go – online right now to a website, and we're researching how much something costs, and we can't find it, we immediately get frustrated. And we don't sit there and we don't dig on that website. We don't say, that's okay, they're a value-based company, I'm going to call them instead. What we do is we keep searching, and we keep going, and once we hit a website, a company that actually answers the question, that's who we're going to call. And ultimately, there's a very good chance that is who is going to get the business. And mm -hmm. so everybody in the world is like that at this point. And so... It's odd to me, it's crazy to me that we all say, I don't hang around, I don't keep digging, I go to another website, I leave, it's my right to know, I'm the customer. But then all of a sudden as a business we say, well, we can't address it. That's not true. It's not true. We can address anything, any business in the world, even regulated industries like financial industries, law, you can address any question in the world. You just can't always answer it. Now, with respect to cost and price, companies – and we've got clients all over the world, David. And they say, so how specific are we? I say, well, we at least got to be willing to explain how it works in the industry, what drives the cost up and down. That's the minimum. And we got to do that well. I'm talking not two or 300 words. I'm talking about five, six, seven, 800 words worth of truly explaining what drives the cost up and down, accessories, factors, you know, uh, packages, whatever that thing is. Now, I do find that the more companies do this, the more specific they get over time. And the reason is because they get better leaf flow. They get better quality of leaves. They, they stop getting tire kickers, and they start getting people that have a very good sense of what it is. I mean, what scares customers isn't putting your prices. What scares them is not putting your prices. 
And the moment we say, I'm just going to treat them as I myself would like to be treated, things change a lot. And, and this is why companies like Zappos changed in industry because they said we're going to send shoes back because it's mm-hmm. just it's what consumers wanted. That's the essence, too, of the Ask You Answer. Or mm-hmm. in, the case of, in the case of a CarMax, who became the largest retail of used cars in the country, they said, we're going to offer you a five-day money-back guarantee because you're afraid of buyer's remorse. So, okay, we're going to overcome that, that fear, that worry, that issue. And you see different industries doing this over and over again. They're meeting the consumer where they want to be met. If we are willing to do that online, we'll get their trust. If we don't, that's fine. I don't, mm-hmm. If you don't want to, that's fine. But somebody's going to. I mean, that's the fact. Somebody yeah. in your industry is addressing the question. They're going to own the conversation. Whoever owns the conversation generally wins the consumer. Mm-hmm. And you make such a good point. You know, how do you want to be treated, right? And, and uh, I think all of us, you know, at a cocktail party get, you know, tired within 30 seconds of the person who's constantly talking about themselves. And I think that was one of my favorite tweets you've ever put out is when you called it, uh, it's called a blog, not a brag. And I just thought that was you know, four words, and it was genius. And it just, as long as you remember that, uh, as long as companies and marketing managers, like, if, does this sound, I mean, granted, of course, you you know, every now and then you could slip in something in your blog if you get an award and something you're proud of, but it needs to be uh, completely the exception and not the rule. And, you know, you don't want to just be writing about your services and your products. You want to be writing about what do they care about. And, and and what always gets me back to that point is it's called a blog, not a brag. And I always play that in my in my head whenever whenever I'm thinking about is this is this you know content good or is this a good path to take? So I, I know that I don't, I don't. Did you come up with that yourself? Because I thought that was genius and it was just so simple. I, you know, it's just one of those things. I was sitting there one day. I, th- I was in a panel or something like that, and I just said it out of the blue, and all of a sudden, you know, it got tweeted a whole bunch of times. And I said, Oh, oh. that's a sticky one right there. See, and you never know when this stuff is going to come out. But, but, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we see this in all facets of life. You know, sometimes people, they get in front of an audience to speak, and they try so hard to sound smart. And everybody in that audience can quickly pick up on the fact that they're trying to sound smart, and so they look stupid, right? Mm-hmm. So like the moment you try to sound smart, you look stupid. Well, it's, mm-hmm. it's the same thing when, you're, when, you're, when you approach digital marketing. You approach it from a teacher's perspective. You're not there to prove anything. You don't need to prove yourself. The content merits what it gets. And so you're going to be a teacher, and because you're a teacher, you're going to get the respect, the adoration of the audience. The moment that the audience senses that you're trying to sound like Mr. Mr. Cool Guy or Gal <laughs> and that you're trying to sound intellectually superior, that's when you start to lose people, and you see people suffer from that online, too, and companies suffer from that online, too. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm lucky. I won't ever have that problem. My wife reminds me all the time with my poor vocabulary. So. <laughs> question. Never, That's why we get married. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, you know, on that note, you know, once people get going and, you know, you just put your logic hat on and, you know, your your experience of what, you, what, you know, what are people asking and all that, and let's say you dry up a little bit, you know, you get a little short on, you know, either creativity or, or thinking. Can you give some advice on how, you know, other ideas on how people can generate topic topic ideas? I know uh, Jeannie Dietrich, um, for the listeners out there, it's G-I-N-I-D-I-E-T-R-I-C-H. Uh, find her online. She she has some great input on, on top blog topic ideas. But can you speak on that for a little bit? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that we've done with clients that's super effective is we say to sales teams, you know, so if, if, if a company or an organization has a sales team, one of the first questions we ask us is, okay, how many sales do we have? Let's say they have 10. How many emails do, do those, does the average salesperson send out a day? Let's say it's 20. And of those 20 emails that each one of those salespeople send out, how many are addressing a question, an issue, a worry, a need, et cetera? And let's just be really, really conservative. Let's just shoot really, really low here, and let's say two of the 20. Well, if that's the case, what I just heard from that company is, well, right now, essentially we're producing at least what is the foundation of 20, two times 10, 20 blog posts a day, but we're never using them again. And that's what's so sad. We, we create content all day long through email process of communication with prospects and clients, and it dies on the vine, on the digital vine. 
And so the smart thing to do is take your sales team or anybody else that's sending those types of emails out and have a, an email address in your company that's like blog ideas at your company.com. And so whenever the salesperson sends that email out, just have them BCC that address. They just know that it's a standard thing. That's what they're supposed to do idea. whenever whenever, whenever they're sending out an email like that. It just, boom, standard. Now, the reason why you send it to blog ideas at your URL.com is because you don't want to blow up, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the CMO's inbox or somebody else's inbox. It's separate. But then the marketing team can go into that list, which by the end of the week, should be 20, 30, you know, um, emails long at least if the organization has a clue. And now all of a sudden, instead of saying, I'm not sure the questions our prospects are asking, I'm not sure the best answers, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, we don't have enough content, yada, yada, yada. Now all of a sudden they're inundated with great content, and it's like, okay, what's next? This is what we need to do. Look at this. We have six emails addressing the same thing. Why don't we have an ebook on that? We obviously need to have a big focus there. So that's the first thing they can do. The second thing, um, especially with our most successful clients, they only they, – marketing always, always, always sits in every sales meeting. That's a must. Uh, that has to happen. That is like 2015. I mean, that has got to happen. It's got to happen now. The idea that some companies still have separate sales marketing meetings is like a tragedy, and it's, and it's really terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that 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 is that. I mean, that that BCC idea. I want to want to just you know reemphasize that. I, I've never heard that idea. Um, that's a phenomenal idea, especially for well, actually for anybody really, but especially for you know multiple person organizations, um, let alone big companies. It's a genius idea for them. I'm sure. How many blog posts? That up. How many blog posts? Potential blog posts are just like going into the digital thin air every right. single day. It's right. an unbelievable number, David. I mean, I've seen a simple click of the mouse, a BCC addition to a culture of the way that you send emails can literally make you millions of dollars in additional revenue next year. When did company. you think of that? I, I, I've never heard that. But I started – I'm surprised you haven't heard me talk about it. I started talking about that like two years ago, I think. I, I, had never, I've never, I really have never heard that any, from anyone, let alone you. I mean, I've just never Maybe heard that. Maybe it's because I, I talk about it mainly in workshops. I talk about it in workshops. Oh. Once we implement a full-blown content culture with a company, that's mm-hmm. one of the things that we talk about. Yeah, so that okay. might be one of the reasons why. Yeah, that's a, that's just I, – I just yeah. That, sometimes ideas that are so simple that just get me, and that one really did. I, I think that's that's, you know – some of the simplest things are the most genius ideas, and that that is awesome. So that that is an amazing way to come up with um, ideas. Now, again, people getting started here, you know, this, you know, this for people getting started. Can you can you give some advice on how people should organize themselves? Not just you gave some good ideas on getting um, organized on accumulating topic ideas. Now what? Well, a few other things. Um, a lot of this depends on the size and scope of the company. I mean, if you're a solopreneur, you you know you you do this brainstorm activity, and then you one of the or any any company could do this, by the way. So you do a brainstorm activity. You say, what are the questions that we get all the time, and what are the questions that we know people are asking the most prolific one, cost questions, comparison questions, all that stuff. So once you do that, then what I like to do is let's say you have 50 questions that you've listed out. What I like to do with clients is, is, is grade each one out as a one, a two, or a three. A one means that um, it is an urgent, let's get it, you know, let's, let's get this one right at the top of the editorial calendar because we get it all the time. A three means, hey, this is, you know, this is fine. We'd like to address this, but we don't get this question a ton, okay? So, so now you are at least prioritizing the content that is having the greatest impact on your sales processes. Because you got to look at content. The, the process of producing content is about sales. It's about producing leads, and it's about um, making people more qualified when they come to you. It's about, I mean, everything is about revenue, right? And you always got to tie it back to that. And so that's why we want to focus on what are the questions that they're asking us the most. Start with that. Don't start with the fluff questions. Don't start with the easy questions. Start with the stuff that people are asking the most and the things that would indicate that they're clearly ready to buy, similar to like cost-based questions. That's one of them. Another thing that you should do, especially if you have a team, is you should identify uh, who your subject matter experts are. In other words, the people that are actually smart enough to talk about something. 
and then figure out the communication style of that particular individual. We have found that everybody has different communication styles, and you can't force somebody to be Victor Hugo that's not Victor Hugo. And so you might say we want to have a culture of content within our company and and then try to get everybody to start blogging. Well, that's not going to work because not everybody can write, and sometimes like pulling teeth. And what we have found that less than 10% of organizations are writers. And so for those people that are writers, that's wonderful, and they can help you produce those blog posts. You can ask them to write something up, and they'll send it to you, and that's wonderful, great. Um, but most people can't do that. So your other types of people, you have another group that is good on video. Lots of salespeople are like this. You can't get them to sit down, but you can get them to, you know, uh, be with you on camera, talk to you just like you were a customer. They're good at that oftentimes. And that can do wonders. I mean, it really, really can. And it's amazing. You know, if you interview a salesperson for one hour and you ask them, let's say, ten different questions, you average about five or six minutes per question in terms of, you know, the answer, the explanation, you know, all those things. And then all of a sudden you've got – uh, hey, we got ten different, yeah, a ton of ten blog posts, ten videos, ten videos you can inject now into your sales process, ten videos you can post on the site, ten blog posts that you can publish on the site, and that's from one hour with a really good salesperson that actually can, you know, uh, that's eloquent enough to talk about that thing that they do, and so that's the video element to it. And then there's a group of people that are great at talking, they just don't like to be on camera, and so that's when you interview them. And you talk to them just like, you know, they would with a customer, and you record it all, and then you turn it into text, and you make them look really, really smart. I mean, the goal of marketing is to make salespeople look smart. That's really it. That's really yeah. it. And if they try doing that, they're going to be way, 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 way more successful. There's going to be way more buy-in. Everybody's going to be into it. Everybody's going to be excited. And so those are really the big three types of content producers you have. And then you have one other one that I call the questioners, and those are just the people on your team that hear questions every day from prospects and customers, don't necessarily have the answers, but they hear lots of questions. Customer service is a good example of a department that does that. And so when you identify the types of, of content producers, per se, that you have on the team, now all of a sudden, if you want to go to Rick that's in sales and say, hey, let's do that video interview this month, he knows it's coming, that's his style, and, and you do that, whereas if you go to me, I might say, hey, I'm going to write this out for you, whatever. And that's that's very, very important, David, because a lot of people just try to, you know, they try to punch, you know, square pegs and round holes when it comes to getting people to participate. That doesn't tend to work so well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wish I would have had that advice a long time ago. <laughs> I definitely tried to play the broad, broad stroke once. And, uh, all right, who can help? You know, instead of saying, you're good at this, do that. So th- that, that's some great advice. Now, now, as far as you get all this content, I, I mean, I would like to throw out one tool out there that we use that um, helps us stay really organized with all of our content, and it's uh, called Trello. We used to use Basecamp, but we use a, are you familiar with uh, Basecamp and or Trello? I'm slightly familiar with some. I've heard great things actually about both of them. I know Trello has you know, become quite popular. Yeah, Trello is really, really easy. So when you have all this stuff, you know, for listeners out there, uh, Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O, it's a, it's a great tool to when you, you know, you can just put all the topics in there, and then you can create checklists, and it can really help, you know, who's going to write this, okay, who's going to put it online, who's going to distribute it, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a really good tool um, to use. But man, those are some great, great, great tips as far as uh, finding, finding different ways to, to get that content, because they really, at the end of the day, the, the content is, is the fuel. And um, and it's the most important part, and obviously executing it all from there is very very important. But um, the content is the most important, and uh, you know getting creative at that, and and um, you know producing lots of lots of good content. Obviously, as as I think both of us know, the uh, it's really turned into put, producing good quality content. There's a lot out there, so don't don't put out crap. Um, uh, and uh, expectations. What should people realistically expect once they get this going? Like how long before they see a return? I, I am, I'm constantly reading, um, you know, seeing studies and people not under, you know, A, either not really knowing how to evaluate this or to measure it, but, you know, P 
people getting frustrated that it's not working and they throw in the towel and, and they give up right away. So can you can you talk about some realistic expectations from your experiences of um, other companies? Well, and, I um, think when you ask that question, you have to define what does it's working mean? Like, so does it working mean that the sales team is better at their job because they can communicate more clearly answers to questions because – they've actually had to produce the content and work on their answers, right? That's an example to me of a victory, the fact that they're better at their job. Or is success um, quantified by the fact that um, because we produce these videos, we're, we're now using them immediately in our sales process, and we're sending them out to prospects before they even meet with the sales team. And because of that, we have stronger relationships with the trust as soon as the salesperson walks in the door, and now our our closing rates have increased while our sales cycles have gone down. That's a victory. You see, David, that stuff can happen immediately. Immediately. To me, that's a big, big deal. And so there's one facet. The other facet is, okay, so when do we start generating more traffic leads and sales? The biggest factor that dictates traffic lead and sales is twofold. A, what type of content are you producing? Is it fluff? Is it based on the questions that I'm asking? Is it those core buyer-based questions that people are asking, like cost and problems and comparison-based questions? Or is it those questions that just don't move the needle? That's fluffy stuff, right? So if you're producing fluff, it's going to be a long time. If you're mm -hmm. producing stuff that is very, very buyer-centric, now it's going to be faster. So that's one of the factors. The other factor is the um, the, the rate at which you produce it. I call it um, the uh, I, I call it the uh, the law of compound information, right? So you've got the law of compound interest, which has two main factors when you figure the law of compound interest. It's okay if you start investing when you're 20, at you know, 20 years of age, and you invest $100 a week, versus the person that starts investing $200 a week at age 30, and both of them turn 60, the guy that invested $100 a week is going to be way richer because he started sooner, right? He started sooner. Mm -hmm. And so time is a, is, a, is, is a big part of this. You want to get started as quickly as possible to, to build it up, and you want the rate of production to be consistent. In other words, you want to make the investment every week. What I have seen as the magic number is this, because everybody still wants to know, if you do everything right, Marcus, what's the magic number? The magic number that I've seen is, you need to produce at least three pieces of content a week if you want to be world-class. Not if you want to be average, world-class, three a week. Okay, it's got to be good. It's got to be buyer-centric, right? That's number one. When we get results from a traffic lead sales perspective, usually somewhere in the three- to six-month mark, you're definitely definitively going to see needles start to move. Mm -hmm. And is that with There's people that right just writing the content, putting it out there, and without amplifying it and targeting that information? Well, I mean, amplification is great, but there's a lot of industries where you can't amplify j jack. You know, there's a lot of B2B spaces, you know. I mean, I was I was talking to somebody this morning that's in the um, um, aerospace maintenance. And it's very B2B, and it's very non-social, trust me. I mean... I couldn't even find much LinkedIn going on there. And so, really? you know, when you talk about amplification of a particular, you know, uh, niche, you don't always have it. And so there's a lot of industries that just aren't very social. And so we want to make sure that we're designing our titles and our content from an SEO perspective, which is the way that they would search it. If we can share it on social, great, but social is only as good as the value we bring to the platform. You've got to keep in mind that you're probably not going to be good at a lot of different types of social media platforms. You're better off just choosing one to be great at at first. Focus on that. Uh, don't be a jack of all social media trades. You're better off just trying to be a master of one. At River Pools, with my swimming pool company, said, okay, let's be great at text and video. We didn't worry about social media for like four years, you know, and that was, you know, <laughs> And I still don't really pay much attention to it today because, you know, most people just don't go to Twitter and brag about how they just spent $100,000 on a swimming pool. They just don't. And I'm okay with that. I'm not trying to force feed Twitter into something that it's really not where my buyers are. And it's not 
I mean, could I generate leads from Twitter? Yes. But, but I want to spend the time on the platforms that are going to have the greatest returns, period. And so companies sometimes need to experiment to find what that is, but I do believe everybody should produce textual and video-based content. That's a given. That's a law. That's where it all starts. And you want to do that as consistently and persistently as possible. Mm hmm And I know this kind of sounds like a similar question as, like, expectations, but, uh, you know, different metrics, milestones, goals. You know, if people are just getting into this and they want to, you know, have something to measure, um, what do you suggest they pay attention to? What what milestones, goals should should people concentrate on? Well, yeah, I'm, you know, to me, uh, not to beat a dead horse, but I I really do consistently just look at what is with our traffic lead sales, traffic lead sales. Yeah, we got to see more leads. We want them to be not just more but better, right? And so yeah. we want to be able to directly attribute revenue to the constant production, right? And so unless you're using certain types of analytics tools, you, you can't really do it very well. That's why we use HubSpot. It's not the only one out there, but, you know, we don't have time to talk about that. It's another Pandora's box. But But being able to measure something is really, really powerful. And being able to say, we got this many sales because we produced this content, we use this platform, spent this much on PPC, but I made this much money. I spent this much time and effort on content marketing, but I made this much money. I spent this much time and effort on social media marketing, but I made this much money. I can say those things. That's powerful, and therefore you can justify budgets and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I, I mean, I don't know how much uh, <laughs> it matters if I agree or disagree with you or not. As You're a supreme expert, but – I, I would have to concur. Um, you know what, what we what we track and we what we give to clients on, on our you know from our marketing company is um, the main metrics we concentrate on are our, our leads and and uh, traffic and, and sales. You know, and I mean, you know, and I, what, I, guys, that's what we have to track. I know we're pulling back the curtains, and uh, that's what uh, that's you know we're really uh, kind of putting it all out there. And if those things don't happen, we're in trouble. But uh, we we have to focus on them, you know, because if this right. stuff's going to work, that's those are the those are the metrics that are going to going to drive it. So it, it's very exciting to to hear that, um, at least from a personal level, that that's what we've been concentrating on, and and to hear you say that that that's um, that's awesome. So and it's the simple stuff too, you know, it's the simple things, you know, it is. That's right. You know, they're they're simple, but you don't have to make it more complicated than it is. Write the good content, have people trust you, have them contact you, have that turn into sales. You know that's it's really the nuts and bolts of it, but obviously you know there there's lots of lots of details and once you you know if you're media into larger company you know hooking up with a company like hubspot you you'll see that there that there's a whole lot of testing and tracking and analytics that can go into it but um sure. you know you got to reach the level of 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 needing that but you know that that is definitely an amazing source to go with now um moving on to like budget for for somebody who's getting started that is just going I know this is a crazy hard question to answer because how can you paint a broad stroke from um you know a small solopreneur uh, versus you know a you know time warner cable you know it, it's hard to say but can you give any direction for somebody getting started for like say a one or two man shop versus a medium size versus a larger company or maybe a percentage of their budget? Is there anything that you can speak on in regards to that? No, not so much other than yeah. what I've found is is you um time is time is is the thing here. You know, and I've seen small companies, David, just kill it in this space because they didn't put a bunch of red tape around themselves and create a bunch of false obstacles along the way. And then I've seen companies that were big, that had all the money and resources, and they stunk up the joint because mm -hmm. they created a bunch of false obstacles. Ah, you know, just, you know, we've got all these other initiatives. Love that word, initiative, <laughs> right? So because they have all these other initiatives, digital marketing slides down, you know, despite the fact that we're full-blown into the digital age, let's just kind of forget the whole digital marketing side of it, right? Let's go mm -hmm. put a billboard out there right now. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's, that's, that, I see that. Then I see companies that are big, but they act like 
what I call, instead of being a, a Goliath, they're a digital David. They think quick and fast, nimble, and that's beautiful to see. I will say this. Some of the most successful companies at this have absolutely have somebody that owns this. And so if it's a bigger team, you need to have a content manager, somebody that's really, really good at writing, editing, interviewing, and video. And so, you know, that's a position that costs money, but daggone it's worth it when you can produce mm -hmm. it in-house and have that person interviewing your team, your subject matter experts. And so, you know, once you have the money to do that, how much, you know, like how much is that? I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I, once I know, you start don't talking about million-dollar-plus companies, yeah. I would say – about time to probably bring in a content manager. Bottom line is invest some of your your money into content marketing <laughs> at the very least, if not if not First a, a case, large your percentage. time. First case, yes. your time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, what about um, doing it yourself versus hiring an outside agency? You know, how, I, I guess you know another hard question to answer. You know, how how can companies decide on which path to take? Um, I guess it would just depend on skill set and what you like to do and, and time, but, you know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I, you know, I would say the, the good thing about working with an agency is that you're probably going to get stuff done and you're going to get some results. But the drawback to an agency is you rarely see unbelievable results, like world-class results because agencies work under you know like restrictions and they have like they, the, the the agreement is we'll do six blog articles a month that's it six blog articles a month you want more than that you gotta pay you want more videos you gotta pay i get that it should be more but it's powerful when a company can produce this stuff in-house and say we want to produce 12 video series this month bam let's do it let's go rock this thing out that's the most successful company, the ones that aren't sitting there putting, you know, self-imposed limitations, but are saying, how much, pop, how much content can we produce? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's, what's preventing us from producing more ourselves? Mm -hmm. Let's do more. I mean, because the fact is there's a direct correlation between quantity and quality and content marketing success. And it's not an either or. It's, you know, have great quality and put a lot of it out there, and you're going to be more successful than the one that just has quantity or just has quality. Now, have you seen some of those companies um, team up with agencies in in a unique relationship where they're producing part of the content and and producing the bulk of the content? The agency just yeah, I've seen, manages I've seen, and, got, and does all the rest of it. You've got and I, like my company, we don't produce any content. We coach people on how to do it, and we help edit it for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's the way that we do it. There's a lot mm -hmm. of agencies that they have a bunch of writers on staff, and they, they pretty much do all of it. And then there's mm -hmm. some, some even more hybrid-based. I think no matter what, if you're going to pr be producing good content, your team is going to be involved in some way, shape, or form. They're going to be getting interviewed by somebody. They've got to have, they've got to have their head in the game. You know what I'm saying? They've got to be involved. Your content, it's like the digital soul of your business. And if you're outsourcing it so much that it doesn't sound like you, we have a problem because when the leads start to come in and they meet you, they're going to say, this ain't the person that I was that I was reading online. This ain't the company. It doesn't have the same feel, the same vibe. And so you want it to reflect truly who you are, the soul of your business. Mm hmm Well, Marcus, every time uh, I sit down and talk with you, uh, you know, I seem to learn something new, and and I and I hope uh, I hope everybody out out there you know was able to get a few a few golden nuggets from Marcus, and uh, as he is he is truly one of the very best sales trainers, uh, content marketing training experts around, and uh, you know you don't have to not that you shouldn't you definitely should if if you can attend his his uh, seminars and or bring him into your company, but Marcus tell people how they can learn from you on an everyday basis, uh, as well as if some companies do want to reach out to you to, to hire you to come consult with their business? Well, you can you can always uh, check out my website, thesaleslion, L-I-O-N, dot com, thesaleslion.com. I'm at the sales line on the Twitters. Got a, another podcast called Mad Marketing. And um, 
And, uh, and uh, it's Marcus at the salesline.com is my email. So don't hesitate to email me either. David, it's, it's been quite the pleasure. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be on your show. Yeah, yeah, man, Marcus, I, I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we'll look forward to getting you back on. And I think maybe next time we can talk about ways of, you know, getting this content out there, um, you know, distributing it and whatnot. But I'm sure we'll have probably 100 other things to we'll want to talk about as well. So, hey, man, I appreciate your time today, and uh, until next time. Thank you. All right, thanks.